Today I'm going to talk about work. Uh, because over time, work and dependency have been linked together in two ways, I think. First, in order to survive, human beings depend on the activities that we call work. Uh, so human beings are dependent on work. But secondly, the activities that we call work, in turn, create social relations between humans that have the character of dependencies. So having to make a living to survive, that's one form of dependency, and becoming entangled in other people because of this need to support oneself. This, I think, is the nexus between work and dependency. And in my talk today, two recent developments in historical scholarship uh, will intersect in my, in my talk. Um, so first, we have the revitalized interest in labor relations across time and space, to which this center, the Bonn Center for Dependency and Slavery Studies, bears witness. Second, we have the increasing interest in and reliance on technologies for analyzing large amounts of historical data that we often talk about today as big data or digital humanities. So I was very glad to hear yesterday uh, when Stefan Kohnemann introduced us to this um, uh, um, center and, and to this uh, research project that he too mentioned the digital humanities because I will also be talking a lot about what, what they offer uh, uh, historians of work. I think the intersection of an interest in work and labor and an interest in digital humanities and new technologies. This intersection is felicitous because a better understanding of labor relations in the past and how they have changed over time requires, I think, both large amounts of data and a more precise understanding of what to look for in the sources. So as a historian of the early modern period, I know that there are these immense volumes of historical texts that we, that we want to use. But how can we do this in the most efficient manner? So searching large corpora of historical texts for words such as slave, serf, servant, wage laborer, may yield interesting results, of course. But I think we also need to be sensitive to the many other ways um, in which work was talked about and described at various points in time. So historians of work in the early modern period, we know that occupational descriptors or occupational titles, if you like, so titles like shoemaker or peasant or what have you, they can be highly misleading indicators of what people actually did to support themselves. And this is partly because of the phenomenon of by employments, blurry activities. People did very many things that their occupational titles do not capture. So that's one reason. Another reason why occupational titles are often de <coughs> deceptive is that they were often linked to notions of honor and status, and therefore they were probably overused when people described themselves. Or conversely, they were linked to notions of dishonor and lack of status, and therefore probably underused, at least in self-descriptions. And I think there is reason to suspect that in the same way, descriptors that signal a specific type of labor relation may also be deceptive. So to give you an example of what I mean, we tend to assume that in early modern society, young people in employment were always hired as servants on an annual or at least a very long-term basis, because this is what early modern labor legislation prescribed. And we think that a servant was therefore in a very different labor relation than a wage laborer. However, we do find examples in historical documents, anecdotal evidence of young people hired on much shorter term contracts, which gave them much more freedom to negotiate the terms under which they worked, including terms of payment. So are we here talking about a servant or a wage laborer? So you see, the the titles that people um, 
or described with may be uh, deceptive. So I think this case illustrates the need to approach sources with an open mind about what titles could mean, and we also have to mine the sources for many examples to be able to say if this one case that I just uh, mentioned was exceptional or if it reflected more general patterns. So in this paper I will discuss the possibility of automatically identifying parts of texts that are likely to say something about labor relations. And following Karin Hofmeister and her uh, colleagues at the Institute of Social History in Amsterdam, I understand labor relation to mean, quote, with and for whom you work and under what rules, unquote. So in other words, labor relations refer to the social and legal relationships in which a person becomes entangled through her work activities. And we know that labor relations were many and diverse in the early modern period. And as Jane Whittle has pointed out, they also changed, sometimes quite dramatically in this period. But these processes are incompletely understood. So I think that if historians can, if we can identify markers, things in texts that signal labor relations in a reliable manner, um, we may benefit more from the opportunities that the digital humanities offer. So by paying attention to the linguistic character of these markers, as I call them, and I will talk more about them, historians and computer linguists may be able to work more efficiently together with the objective of increasing knowledge about labor relations in past societies. Now, I'm moving into a part of my talk where I will talk about types of data for the history of work. And so, so, uh, so, so what I'm going to talk about now is essentially methodology and methodological choices that we uh, do as historians. So looking at the history of work, we can identify, I think, four main types of data that historians have relied on namely wage data, data on payment, occupational descriptors, for instance, shoemaker, work activity data, what people were actually doing, and finally data on labor relations, the conditions under which work was performed. And in fact, each of these four types has yielded a specific historiography. So using wage data, scholars like Robert Allen uh, and Jane Humphreys and others have researched and debated, for instance, whether or not there was a high wage economy in Britain prior to the Industrial Revolution. And using the second type of data, occupational descriptor data, the Cambridge Group for Population Studies and Social Structure has mapped and analyzed sectoral shifts, as they call it, and by extension they have contributed to the understanding of economic development. And thirdly, based on work activity data, scholars like Sheila Ogilvie, Jane Whittle and Mark Halewood, and the Gender and Work Group in Uppsala that I represent, have contributed to the understanding of the gender divis division of work. And finally, we have the sources of labor relations that we are focusing on in, in, during this conference. And of course, the sources to labor relations are many, and I will not try to sum summarize them. Uh, here. So, of course, the ideal scenario for a historian would be to have easy access to all four types of data. But that is very seldom the case. We often have to choose. And in the Gender and Work Project, we have chosen to use work activity data, in other words, data on practices, as our key type of information. So, such observations typically take the form of a verb phrase consisting of a verb and a direct object that to, together describe the work tasks in question. So uh, phrases like make charcoal, pick lice from someone, build house, steal clothes, deliver letter, all of these are work activities and we're really down on, on the really micro level. Uh, we talk about them in terms of verb phrases. <clears throat> 
Now, I think that there are a number of advantages with work activity data, and that is why we have chosen to focus on them. So contrary to wage data, the first type of information, activity data capture both paid and unpaid work, and I think that's imp very important if we study societies with a low degree of specialization. It's also very important if you want to capture the work of women. Activity data are also more similar to a direct um, sort of an anthropological observation of work, whereas these occupational descriptors uh, can be seen as more indirect um, evidence in the sense that the scholar assumes that the occupational descriptor can serve as a proxy for the work activities that the people actually carried out. And as I just explained, I think that that assumption does not work very well uh, in, early modern, in the early modern period. Uh, moreover, uh, yet another ad advantage of work activity data is that provided that you have sufficient amounts of activity data, these lend themselves to time use studies, which is in fact what the United Nations and the World Bank advocate today for studies of economic development and the economic situation of people in the world today. So as you see, there are a number of um, advantages connected with this uh, verb-oriented method uh, that we have developed and that yields this type of, uh, of, of information. Um, however, I must admit that activity data have their drawbacks too. So for instance, the same work activity may mean very different things depending on the conditions under which it was carried out. So depending on the labor relation. To knit stockings for your own use is something else than to knit stockings that you plan to sell on a market. And knitting stockings in a factory for a wage is, again, something different. And of course, so is knitting stockings for your owner if you are a slave. So I think that I'd, ideally we want information on both what the work consisted in the sustenance activity, if you like, and the conditions under which work was carried out. Um, so, in the Gender and Work Project, we study what men and women did in Sweden to support themselves in the period 1550 to 1880, and we do this by extracting often very fragmentary information in the form of verb phrases that we put into a database and um, of course together with information on who carried out the work activity and today we have more than 30,000 observations of this kind spread out over time and of course in order to be able to overview this massive amount of uh, data we have to categorize them and we put the work activities into different categories such as agricultural work crafts, um, transport, trade, etc. And today I will discuss one of these categories, a subset of data collected within the project. And this subset consists of observations we made in the sources that were at first disappointing. They were disappointing because they were vague and unspecific with respect to what type of work they actually referred to. So typically, these activities were described in the sources simply as to work, or to serve, or to help. So very vague descriptions of what the work actually consisted in. Sometimes these descriptions could be even vaguer and simply state that someone had been in a specific place at a certain point in time. Still, the general understanding one would get from reading the full case was that the person was present because of his or her work. So it was a very, talking about presence was a very convoluted way uh, for the source of talking about work. Now, as you will understand, these observations could not be ca ca categorized in the same way as, for instance, harvest wheat, which would be an agricultural activity, or make shoes, which would be a craft activity. 
In fact, these very vague descriptions of work were not any better than the vague occupational descriptors that one can also come across, such as laborer or worker. Um, so both to work and worker, to serve and servant, are, 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 they are vague in the same way, because what they do is that they leave the actual work unspecified. Still, when we came across these vague verb phrases, we did collect them, and we did that because they were about work, and um, also because women were relatively common among those whose work was described in these vague ways, as simply serving or working. So we decided to put these vaguely described activities into a category of their own and called it unspecified work. And for the purpose of this conference, I decided to inspect this subset more closely, asking myself, okay, when people talked about work without specifying it in terms of tasks, what did they instead talk about? Um, and this is what I'm going to uh, present to you now. So uh, what I, I will talk about here um, is based on 732 observations of vaguely described work. And the sex ratio in this little body of evidence was relatively even with 57% of the observations describing male work and 43% describing female work. And this is um, <laughs> remarkably uh, gender equal uh, because in studies based on work activity data, you usually don't um, come very much over 30%. So this is a little summary of three, uh, the three main studies based on work activity data. Sheila Ogilvy's study of uh, Württemberg, where she had 33% of all work activities being performed by women. Uh, the first phase of the Gender and Work project, where we had 20 or 22 percent, a little bit depending on how you count. And then there is the study by Jane Whittle and Mark Halewood, uh, where they studied five uh, counties in England, and they reached 29 percent. So you see, a gender, a gender ratio of 57 to 43 is remarkably uh, equal for um, the time period and for the type of of information that we are talking about. Um, I should also say before I go on that the, these um, uh, activities were culled mainly from court records. To some extent we also use accounts, um, petitions and diaries, but most of the information comes from court records. What you have here in this little uh, table is the 732 observations divided between men and women. Here you have type of contextual information. And this is what I will uh, take you through in a minute. Here you have data for men. Here you have data for women. Here you have the totals. Here you see uh, 314 is 43% of uh, 732. Now, in each um, case, uh, there could be several um, forms of contextual information uh, that, than just one. So, on average, in each case, there were 1.4 descriptions of work. So, that's why this number is higher than that number. Um, so, as this table shows, uh, the most common way of talking about work when you did not specify it in terms of a task was to mention um, for whom the work was carried out. So you see here 34 percent. And this was true for both men and women. See here. That was the most common way of talking about work. If you did not specify what work consisted in, then you talked about for whom it was carried out. And the person for whom the activity was, was performed was often the master or mistress of the household. 
which is unsurprising in view of the small scale and rural character of most production units in early modern Sweden. And examples of this construction um, are a maid servant who served the man Ingel Håkansson. She served um, at his farm, etc. So, th this kind of data, this is what I'm, I'm talking about. Um, but information on for whom work had taken place could also describe other types of employers. It could be work for relatives, for one's family. But in all these cases, work was described not as a specific task, but as a relationship between two specific persons, unless, in some cases, work was described as being done for oneself. So, I work to support myself. So, that, there we're not talking about a social relationship, but they were uncommon. Many of these relationships, one can suspect, were hierarchic, but uh, not all of them. So, one example of the latter was when two women in Stockholm described their work in terms of for whose benefit they worked, without re referring to an employer. So they did they work, they did, they said, in order to, quote, support our poor husbands, unquote. So this, this tells us that the women were supporting the husbands in this case. There are also other examples of women describing their work as help. Often married women who worked in the household of others um, prefer to talk about their own work as helping rather than serving, suggesting, I think, a more symmetrical social relationship. It doesn't mean that the relationship was symmetrical, but that's how they wanted to portray it. But men's work could also be described as help. So, for in example, one man was described as helping his brother. That's how he's, he described his work. In other cases, information on the place where work had taken place was in focus rather than for whom it was performed. Alternatively, uh, information on when or for how long work had been going on could also be added. Uh, so, where a little girl served at the farm, so we get to know where it took place, when she served for one and a half year, and a combination of information types could also be used, of course, as for instance in she served uh, Nils Håkonsson in Nes for six years. She served a potter in our town. Um, so in total, 20% of all unspecified work was described in terms of place, time or duration. And in many of these cases, mentioning a place, so a farm, a village, a town, was probably an alternative to mentioning the master or the mistress because they were probably strongly associated in the local community with the place in question. So therefore I think we can uh, look upon <coughs> we can look upon um, for whom, where, for how long and when as the same category, or we can, we can lump them together. Uh, and together, um, they made up 54% of all these descriptions. Now, the second most common way of describing unspecified work was to focus on the income it generated, um, or should rightfully have generated for the worker. Such cases could be indications of how work spawned conflicts between master and servant, employer and employee, but this was not necessarily the case. Indeed, many of the descriptions mentioning income came from account books or from sources produced within the tax administration, so they merely stated that payment was due or that payment had been had happened. So 17% of the descriptions had to do with aspects of income. And the third most common um, way of talking about work, unspecified work, was to talk about the conditions uh, to which the implicit or explicit contract exposed the worker. So when the employment began, when it ended, for how long it had been going on, were all things mentioned either because there was some kind of conflict 
Um, or because the employee served as a witness at court and it was important to know whether he or she was still employed by one of the parties to the dispute. And here I think it's important to keep in mind that young people who lacked independent means were legally obliged to offer themselves for work in Sweden, as in many other European countries. These laws provided heads of households with the instruments to force young people into service and likewise help them prosecute young people who had left their service before the end of the agreed upon time. So 16% of all descriptions were related to, to contract. So here you have all, all the examples, payment, for instance, promised two barrels of corn, contract, he got himself a master. So these. These, ex these are just examples, but they give you a, a sense of, of what I have put into these different boxes. Um, now, people could also talk about with whom they had worked. This was not so common, uh, but to give you one example, in one case, a woman was described as working with a man while they were both at Anders Andersons. So, presumably, this should be understood as they were both in Anders Andersons' service. And in other cases, a man and a woman were described as having been, quote, together in service, unquote. And the context in which this sort of information surfaced was often in investigations into alleged fornication or other forms of sexual misconduct. So when the accused parties were interrogated about their contacts with each other, they described how they had come, become acquainted when they worked together. So you see here their need to support themselves had brought them into contact with each other. About 3% of all descriptions say something about with whom people worked. Um, and then there were also a number of hard to classify, um, a number of hard to classify cases. And you have them here. I call them concrete descriptions of work, um, where a person's work was described in a, a concrete and even emotionally loaded manner, but with emphasis neither on the task nor on their labor relations, but more on the experience of work. So pe people would say things like, I work with my hands, or I sit for myself. This is a literal translation from the Swedish. I guess in English, I fend for myself would be a better uh, translation, but I sit for myself was the way they said it. I do my chores. I went there and did my work. Uh, I went there. Uh, and from the context, you understand that they did that as a part of their job. A woman belonging to the higher echelons of society stated that, quote, Having no maid, I had to do everything myself, unquote. And a woman from a lower social class was dis described as having, quote, made herself useful in many ways, unquote. And she had never been lazy in any way, it was added. So in this group, we find many vivid expressions of how arduous work could be. And 7% of all these descriptions had this character of concrete characterization of work. And finally, there were a few cases where no work of any kind was explicitly mentioned. Um, and the person in question was simply described as having been in a specific place. So evidence of presence and nothing else, really. And examples of this expression are at the time when she was at the farm or for the short time period she spent there. But as I already indicated, a full reading of these cases often show that it referred to a person working at the place where she or he was said to have been. That is to say, talking about someone's presence was an elliptic way of talking about their work. Now, I admit that this interpretation is a bit tenuous, but in view of how common it was to describe work in terms of the place where it was carried out, or the place where the master or the mistress lived, I still find it plausible. <laughs>
Um, okay, so of course when we look at the data that I have presented to you, uh, the patterns that we discern in the material have to be evaluated with an eye to source criticism. So talking about where, when, for how long and for whom a person had worked were ways of placing him or her geographically in a so and in a social hierarchy, but probably also a way of identifying them. And many of these descriptions, as I said, derive from court records, and it's reasonable to think that adding information on this, of this kind uh, helps the court establish the credibility of the person in question and the possible biases in their accounts. And the cases where income was in focus, they often came from accounts or from sources produced within the tax administration, but the income could also be of interest in court cases. And the court's interest in whether or not a wage had been paid could be prompted by the taxation system. So at this time in Sweden, a head of household was liable to, sp to pay a special tax for any servant to whom he or she paid a wage. And so I think it's against this backdrop that we should read cases where it was specifically pointed out that maid servants staying in particular houses did not work for a wage. So the tax implications of wage payments suggest that people generally had an interest in hiding paid work and that the sources are likely to underreport them. So these are a couple of comments that relate to the kind of source crit criticism that you have to uh, expose the material to. So coming back to my initial question about markers of, of labor relations, um, things that computer linguists might find useful when they want to help historians find data about labor relations in huge amounts of texts, I think the analysis showed that contrary to these task-specific verb phrases that regularly came with a direct object, now I'm using grammatical terminology, I hope you're um, familiar with grammatical terminology. So verb phrases with a direct object such as mow grass, repair shoes, paint portrait, collect tax money. Verbs describing unspecified work was often presented with an indirect object instead, so for whom work was carried out. And the verbs could also be determined by various adverbs that linked the work activity to a place, to a point in time, or to a duration of time. The second and third most common types of information had to do with income and contract, uh, as you saw. And um, so the various conditions under which work was performed. And in these cases, I don't think it's possible to identify specific grammatical entities as markers. Instead, I think it would be interesting to think of specific words or collocations of words that may function as markers. So words such as wage, pay, paid, enter service, leave service, etc. But of course, labor relations could be expressed in uh, much more subtle ways. So in a case from 1721, analyzed in our project, uh, a maidservant who wanted to leave her mistress before the end of the employment term was asked to arrange for, an, for another young woman to replace her. And the servant fulfilled her mistress's wish and was herself then allowed to leave. And I think it's interesting to think about who did what in this case and what does it say about labor relations and about dependencies. So to hire a servant was a form of managerial work that we would normally expect masters and mistresses to do. And in this case the initiative was indeed taken by the mistress, but the actual task was however carried out by the former servant. So the mistress delegated managerial work, managerial power, to a person in a subordinate position. And um, there are other examples of the same kind, uh, showing how people carry out tasks that we do not normally uh, associate with those in a subordinate position. Um, 
so what does these what, what do these descriptions of delegation do with our understanding of the labor relation because they were not described ex explicitly as delegations this is my uh, the interpretation that i put on them can we find ways of automatically identifying them in historical texts so now for my conclusions so my experiences from the Gender and Work Project have raised my awareness of the linguistic characteristics of historical texts. If we're interested in work as practice, as something people do, we want to look out for certain types of verbs and verb phrases in the documents, because it is the job of verbs to describe activities. This insight led, in turn, to new ideas about how we might use language technology for automatic identification of information that would otherwise be very time-consuming or indeed impossible uh, to extract. So here I have tested this approach, how it might work for labor relations. And I want to stress that I have not relied on uh, computer linguists to do this. So I've, I've done this analysis manually, but with the purpose of pointing out things that we would like to, like the computer linguists, to help us find in texts. So the analysis showed that when people did not talk about their work as tasks, they talked about it in terms of a social relation of some sort. And in fact, I think it's striking how well Karin Hofmeister's definition of labor relation fits with the data I have presented here. So she said a labor relation is with and for whom you work and under what rules. And as you saw, in more than 50% of all cases, work was described in terms of for whom, where, when, and for how long it had taken place. Um, so, um, when the category unspecified work, what it caught in our net was thus social and legal relationships situated in space and time. Could also be defined in terms of income or as an implicit contract. <coughs> so, to a high degree, they said something about the rules under which work had taken place. So I think these results suggest that it is fruitful to mine historical texts for vague verb phrases such as to serve, to work, to help, both because it's a form of work description where women appeared almost as often as men did, uh, and because um, this is what people at the time may have associated work with more than these specific tasks. So work was described in terms of belonging somewhere and to someone. It was described in terms of mutual but often asymmetrical fulfillment of duties. In contrast to concrete descriptions of tasks, these vague descriptions highlighted the many relationships and dependencies that work brought about in the early modern period. Thank you.